pleasure, Ben. All right, well, uh, um, yeah, so it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank, uh, thank them for the invite to come here and to, to give this talk. Uh, this is uh, work I did at the beginning of this year with other people from MECA, Gianluca Inverso, who is a postdoc, and Emmanuel Lugato, who uh, last year graduated. Uh, so uh, my title is uh, it's a bit of propaganda. Uh, I, I claim this is all rigid and equal to supersymmetric backgrounds. I'll actually talk a little bit about actions also, uh, time permitting. But I should also warn you that that all uh, should probably have an asterisk on it. Uh, what I'm actually going to be discussing are all global backgrounds. Uh, there will certainly there, there are certainly possibilities of do, do, doing discrete quotients that aren't included in the classes that we're talking about here, which I'll get to when I, when I get there. So let me begin with a little bit of motivation. Um, if you've seen sort of talks on Bridget Susie, it's sort of all, always the same motivation. Uh, so recently there's been a lot of work in the last five to 10 years on exploiting rigid supersymmetry on curved manifolds. To some extent, this started with really with, with, with Pestoon's calculation for n equal four uh, super young mills. Uh, there were a lot of interesting papers in three dimensions, like papers by Kostin and Belos and Yakov, testing various dualities. Uh, by Ramsberger, papers by Perez, Kosmichi um, Lee, etc. Generally, the idea being to calculate various indices for supersymmetric uh, theories and relate them to partition functions on certain curved manifolds. Uh, but those all, um, after all, sort of the sequence of papers, it was sort of very natural to sort of take a step back and ask a uh, sort of a simpler question, which is how do you even put a known supersymmetric field theory on a curved manifold to begin with? Um, until recently, this was done piecemeal, theory by theory. You can do this, you know, if I, if I have, for example, an SN, it's in a sense straightforward to figure out all of the inverse uh, radius terms you need to add to your theory to your supersymmetry transformations to actually put it on the curved manifold. But how do you do it in general? This was answered, I think, four years ago now by Pestucci and Cyborg, who gave a systematic approach to this, which was to think of, just in a nutshell, to derive rigid supersymmetry from supergravity. And in a few slides, I'll actually review that in a bit more detail. But after they gave a systematic approach, uh, there were sort of a large sequence of papers uh, really hitting this home. So uh, for the n equal 1 with one or more supercharges, I would say has more or less been put to bed. Uh, very nice paper by Dumitrescu, Vestucci, and Cyberg, who looked at all possible Euclidean theories, starting with assuming one supercharge and working their way up to four supercharges, analyzing the possible backgrounds, admitting that those number of supercharges. Uh, there's also a nice paper uh, by Cassani, Claremontelli, Tomasiello, and Zaffaroni. The jet classification complete, completed one to four. I. I would actually dispute that their classification is complete. Uh, I would argue that their classification, I believe they looked at, in the first paper they looked at old minimal supergravity, or new minimal supergravity. The next paper they looked at old, uh, old minimal supergravity. I would argue that isn't the complete set of possibilities for n equal one. I, I would argue that you could also look at 16 plus 16 supergravity, which in principle should, should contain the existing cases as special cases. But for any given set of auxiliary fields, have they uh, completed the, uh, not the number of supercharges being one, two, three, and four? I believe so. Okay. I believe they, um, so they did, they did one, they did two of the same chirality, two of different choralities, and then four. Okay. Yeah. But I, I will say that uh, if you did 16 plus 16 supergravity, I think there is a possibility of finding something different. Okay. Thank you. So there are also papers that dealt with the Lorentzian case, um, but where I'm coming in, where, where our perspective on this uh, was, was that there hasn't been a lot of work on, on n equal two, for the n equal two theories. And in a sense, you, you think that might be surprising because n equal two theories, they have interesting features, they have more SUSE to exploit. Um, there really was just, when, when we started, there was just uh, two papers really that dealt with this, a paper by Clara and Zaffaroni that, is, that took one supercharge in n equal two, and then sort of a more indirect paper by Gupta and Murthy in the context of uh, um, localization uh, in supergravity of black holes uh, that sort of did the same thing. Uh, yeah? Question. How do you tell the, if you're just looking at one supercharge, how do you tell the difference? 
Excellent. Wait a slide. I'll, I'll answer that. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to address is the, the following questions. Maybe two slides. Uh, we're going to address the following questions. Uh, first, uh, what are all the curved backgrounds that are consistent with full rigid n equal two SUSY? So keeping all eight supercharges for n equal two. Sort of the opposite extreme. The more you know, the most restrictive case you could imagine in the menagerie of n equal two possibilities. And after that. What are all the rigid actions for vector multiplets and hypermultiplets that you could conceivably construct to couple in those backgrounds? So I think I didn't ask you this before. Sure. So if my theory happened to have superconformal symmetry as well, that right. would be an addition to the ones you're counting. Right. I mean, at the moment, I'm, I'm yeah. So I mean, for this, I'm, I'm just looking at solutions. I'm going to basically be looking at solutions, if you wish, of sort of the Poincaré Killing Spinner equation. Or to put it another way, I'm looking at the class of you know superconformal solutions for which eta vanishes, uh, if you wish. So, um, no, I should no. Let me rephrase that. It's the class of solutions for which eta is proportional to epsilon, uh, with certain proportionality constants, which I'll elaborate on uh, in a minute. Um, I'll try to, uh, yeah, I'll come back to that in like five slides. Okay. I can answer your question a bit more. Uh, so this is uh, my outline. Uh, I'm going to start with reminding you something, or reminding uh, about some things, some lessons from rigid super gravity, bringing in some ideas from superspace. This will actually lead really naturally into a discussion of super coset spaces, which are how we, uh, in terms of which we're actually able to, to classify these spaces. And finally, time permitting, I'll talk a little bit about matter actions that you can put in these backgrounds. So before getting into too much detail, let's just recall what Festucci and Zyberg did. They proposed that um, a rigid supersymmetry matter action should be thought of as a coupled matter supergravity action, where you freeze the supergravity as a background. This is actually important. The, um, when you're freezing the supergravity as a background, the idea is the metric doesn't obey Einstein's equations. It's just, it's just a metric. It's a frozen metric that you, you plop in what its values are. But what that, that means is the whole multiplet so the metric is off-shell, so the entire multiplet has to be off-shell. And so if you're talking about supergravity, that means because it has to be off-shell, you have to include the auxiliary fields. And the auxiliary fields aren't obeying their equations of motion. They're going to be taking some frozen value. So they're quite important for the analysis. Um, not just any rigid manifold admits SUSY. It has to obey the killing spinner equation. So in your supergravity theory, your Killing Spinner equation arises by requiring that the variation of the gravitino vanish. That has your standard uh, connect, uh, you know, connection transformation, the derivative of the Killing Spinner. And then there are terms involving auxiliary fields, which I'm being very schematic about, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about in more detail in just a bit. Um, the idea here is the Killing Spinner is parameterized by some constants, epsilon. And those constants, the number of constants that I have, the number of linearly independent constants, is what I mean by the number of supercharges that I have. So for 4 dn equal 2, I'm saying I want eight supercharges. I want to have eight linearly independent constants, epsilon, that I can construct C of x out of. In Minkowski, of course, these are the same thing. There are, the auxiliary fields are all zero. I just have derivative of C vanishes. And I have eight of them when you count all the spinner and SU2 indices. In other backgrounds, you might expect something like C of x to be some dressing factor times epsilon. So I want to make two observations about this. Um, the first is, um, well, first observation is sort of an ob obvious observation. It's there to contrast with the second observation. The first observation is, for a given n, I have a given set of auxiliary fields in a given equation. As I increase the number of supercharges that I'm requiring, I get stronger conditions. And that should just be obvious. As I, have, as I say, I want two or three or four, I, I get greater and greater restrictions on my manifold and on what my auxiliary fields can be. But which is perhaps not obvious is that if I increase n, I'm actually changing this equation itself. Because I'm changing, I've suppressed it here, but I'm changing the structure of the R symmetry group. Because I'm changing the structure of the R symmetry group, in principle, I'm changing the structure of the auxiliary fields that can appear. So as I increase n, actually it turns out that the, num the structure of the auxiliary fields becomes more complicated. 
And so what you actually find is that increasing n tends to give you weaker conditions because there's just more freedom. And in fact, what I'm going to show um, during the course of this talk is that if I take eight supercharges for n equal two, I actually have a richer structure than four supercharges for n equal one, which might have been otherwise, you might have thought that, that that seems completely bonkers. And it's precisely because the auxiliary field structure becomes more complicated. Okay. Is that actually, yeah. So again, yeah, I mean, I have to know what this thing looks like to know if it's n equal one or n equal two. But that's, that's a very good question. And you cannot go beyond eight Suzy charges, right? To all zero fields, correct? Uh, yeah, I mean, the fact that I really want to think about this as off shell, um, I could pro you could probably do n equal four. You'd have to be, you'd have to look at it from a conformal standpoint, because only conformal supergravity is off shell. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say that you couldn't do it, but the paradigm would have to be a little bit different. So, um, so I want to recall the situation for n equal 1. In n equal 1, um, there are two different off-shell supergravities that people tend to use. They're, they're called old minimal and new minimal, just for historical reasons. So for old minimal, uh, the auxiliaries you have are a complex scalar m and a real auxiliary vector, which I'll call it g. And this is the killing spinner equation, or this is one half the, the left-handed part of the killing spinner equation, which you need to solve. I don't want you to remember that. Um, the structure of this is not terribly important. I just want you to see that both objects are appearing. Um, and there's actually some mix of coralities when you have this M object turned on. And if you solve uh, the conditions for four Euclidean supercharges, essentially you find these spaces. You have R cross S3, R cross H3, S4, or H4 as your possibilities. Um, I'm assuming Euclidean, but you get an obvious generalization for Lorentzian signatures. Lorentzian signature. For new minimal, you have a different auxiliary field structure. You have a, a U1R gauge field, um, which gets shoved into the covariant derivative. And instead of uh, this guy, you have a two-form auxiliary with a three-form field string, whose dual one-form appears there. It, it, it basically takes the spot that G takes, and then M goes away, and then A appears inside there. When you solve this equation for four supercharges, you only get half the possibilities. You don't find the S4 or the H4. And so all I'm trying to get across here is that is just to reinforce the idea that the, the choice of auxiliary fields really matters. It, it affects uh, the structure of the solutions. And so our motivation, since we were aware of this, was to try to be really, really agnostic, try to make the most general choice possible, find the most general set of auxiliary fields one could have for n equal to. In other words, what is the most general off-shell n equal to Poincaré supergravity? Well, uh, for eight supercharges and fewer, there's actually a really, really simple way, of, a relatively simple way of answering that question. And the idea is that I don't, really, I shouldn't have to go into too much detail uh, here to get into this. But the idea is that um, a Poincaré supergravity theory I can think of as a conformal supergravity theory coupled to some bile compensating multiple. So conformal supergravity, thankfully, is unique. For the n equal 2, uh, this is its field content, 24 bosons, 24 fermions. In addition to your graviton and gravitino, you have an SU2R gauge field and a U1 gauge field. And then you have uh, auxiliary fields of increasing dimension. An anti self dual tensor, which I'm calling WAB minus, but usually this is called TAB minus. Um, a fermion called chi and an auxiliary D. Now, if I want like the most general Poincaré theory, what I want to do is take conformal supergravity coupled to the most general possible compensating multiplet, which means I'm going to use the longest possible compensator. I'm not going to use a minimal multiplet or a vector multiplet, things that are small. I'm going to use something incredibly big. The biggest thing you can do is take, in superspace language, an unconstrained real superfield, which when you add up the components is truly gargantuan. It's 128 plus 128 degrees of freedom. Thankfully, the vast majority of those are not going to matter. Uh, its field content is, um, its bottom component is a real scalar omega, which is basically your dilatation compensator, which you use to fix your bile degree of freedom. You have a fermion, lambda, uh, which you use to fix your S-SUSY. 
And then these are the fields that you, that you find at the theta squared level. Uh, and then there's lots of other stuff. Turns out the theta squared level is all that we need to worry about. You've got an anti-cell dual tensor, another one, which I'm calling Y. Uh, you have SIJ, which is a complex scalar, which is an isotriplet in our, the R symmetry group, which is U2, I should say. Uh, another auxiliary scalar, G, and another auxiliary scalar that is also an isotriplet, GIJ. Um, I've written uh, his indices is up and down, and his is all down, but I'm using, I'm talking about SU2 for my R symmetry group, so I can raise and lower my SU2 indices with epsilon IJ. And I'm going to do that willy nilly on all the slides. So if you see these guys start changing spaces, that's all that's happening. I'm raising and lowering with epsilon. Why can't you just attach more of those indices? As long as you have a scalar in the multiple, you can use it, right? Right, so yeah, so the idea is I could have something more complicated, um, but Whatever object in the theory is playing the role of like the Planck scale, if you wish, um, has to be um, has to be constructed out of. I mean, there has to be such an object. So let me say this differently. If I have a vector multiplet, or n equal to, its bottom component is usually called x, which is complex and it transforms under the U1 R symmetry. The omega here, in this case, would be something like the absolute value of x. So I would build the comp this general scalar multiplet out of the, the um, sort of the modulus of this guy. And I would forget that there is also the ratio of x to x bar floating around. That could be there, but I don't need, I don't need to worry about it. I can always build this guy. In contrast, if I were talking about a tensor multiplet, bottom component of that is a, um, is a pseudo-real scalar, Lij. The omega here would be something like the square root of Lij, Lij. And so, what are, and so these, these, are, these would be, um, to use terminology, the analogs of old minimal and new minimal. And what, either, with, with either one of these, I could construct such an omega. And what would happen in those cases is these would be composite objects built out of more simple objects. In fact, some of those would be zero for either of those cases. But I don't need to make the choice. I can remain agnostic. That's a good question. So when I put everything together, I get a general Poincaré supergravity theory. Uh, graviton, gravitino, SU2 and U1 gauge fields. Uh, it's convenient to group this guy with the complex conjugate of that guy and call it ZAB. And then these guys just come down. I'm erasing these guys. I'm, I'm not worrying about these guys because I'm only. It turns out I only care about what's happening at the theta squared level, and morally these are these are higher components. Uh, by the way, I should mention the reason I'm calling this thing ZAB is if I had engineered this Poincaré supergravity theory to have a, a complex central charge, this ZAB would be the bosonic field strength of that central charge. Hence the name. Also, you know, it's a letter reasonably close to Y and W, which is actually how we chose it uh, in the first place. And then we realized afterwards, ah, it's a central charge field strength. That's convenient. All right. So I got this general. Sorry, did you assume you W plus? Oh, yeah, W plus, sorry. As uh, opposed to the, the. So it's a complex conjugate of that guy. So Z, um, Z is built out of this guy and the complex conjugate of that guy. The reason is uh, this. This guy, the, the Y and the W transform oppositely under U1R. So this combination transforms homogeneously under U1R. Okay, well, it's all about solving the killing spinner equation. So what's the killing spinner equation for the supergravity? Well, here it is. Again, I don't expect you to know, uh, you know, really you know, write this down or really think about this deeply. The only point is that all of these objects are appearing. Um, and you can also investigate it and convince yourself that essentially all possible structures you could have on the right-hand side of this killing spinner equation are appearing, up to redefinitions of the R symmetry connections inside the covariant derivative. And why does it stop here with this field? Uh, what happens to the higher? Uh, that is an excellent yeah. question. So in principle, I have to write down this equation. And then I have to write down delta Q of every one of those other 128 fermions in my theory. 
before doing that, even in this equation, uh, we see why uh, these extra fields mm -hmm. do not occur. Do not arise in this equation. Like, why don't I already see fermions here? Well, no, even bosons. Presumably, there are also lots of bosons in the dot, dot, dots, right? Uh, oh, no, no. So, um, uh, the dot, dot, dots, uh, sorry. Uh, well, basically, um, those don't appear in the dimension argument. Uh, those so, um, so if you if you look at the dimension of the, uh, the objects appearing, those are all higher dimension. Okay. And so those don't appear. But if I wrote down delta chi, yeah. I would start. Those guys would poison delta chi. Yeah. If I start looking at the whole zoo of 128 fermions that I'm not looking at, they would all appear there. But why don't you look? Magic. It turns out that uh, um, for when you when you go to the eight supercharge case, you don't actually need to solve any of those equations. In fact, you don't even need to solve this equation. It just, you get something that works automatically. So, the easy, it turns out the easiest way of seeing this is actually to go to superspace. Uh, so, uh, if I take this, this generic Poincaré supergravity theory and I write it in superspace, it turns out to be equivalent to a, um, a, su a, a superspace formulation due to Paul Powell. That actually, uh, he used it to describe conformal supergravity, but we're going to use it to describe Poincaré. And I don't, I'm not going to give you all of the algebra, because it's, it's very complicated, but um, I just want to point out sort of the obvious features, which is that if I calculate the algebra of the spinner derivatives, which I'll remind you, the algebra of the spinner derivatives in superspace is isomorphic to the algebra of delta q's and components. It tells you no more and no less than the algebra of the delta q's. The algebra of these things, well, if I take uh, two of these of opposite gravity, I get a vector derivative deformed by Lorentz and R symmetry curvatures. If I take two of these of the same gravity, again, I get Lorentz and R symmetry curvatures. But in the rigid limit, I don't expect to see R symmetry uh, term there. Um, is that uh, because this is a soft algebra you're writing? Well, in print, at, at this the stage, algebra, right, at this stage it's a soft, hmm? Sorry, at this stage, this is a soft algebra. Okay. So this is at the moment. This is this is not even a, a rigid algebra yet. This is just the supergravity algebra in yeah. space. If you go rigid, there will be only uh, on the right hand side. I won't see R symmetry generally. That's not true, actually. You you do see them. If you go to Poincaré, you don't see them. Yes. But it, but for other geometries, you will see them. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And this is actually where some of the magic happens. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Where is it? It's soft. you're eliminating the eight supercharge. I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, in just a moment, when I say when, when I when I um, go to the rigid case, it'll stop being soft. At the moment, all these objects are full space-time dependent things. I haven't. Yeah, I haven't. It's completely off shell. I haven't really done anything yet. I'm just I'm just talking about. You just uh, solved the Bianchi. Yeah, I've just solved the Bianchi things in super space. Yeah. So the magic, where, where everything drastically simplifies, is in the following observation. Um, so a rigid Susie must leave the curvatures invariant. And this is analogous to the following statement. If I were talking about the bosonic isometry, a killing vector, that leaves the metric invariant. If it leaves the metric invariant, it leaves the Riemann tensor invariant. I repeat that story in superspace. Um, I say I've got some super isometry, which is my killing spinner. It leaves, the, if you wish, the super metric invariant. So it has to leave all of the curvature objects invariant. So for example, I have this Sij, which in principle is some function of x and theta. Its delta q variation is some killing spinner, whatever it is, it's contracted into a spinner derivative of this guy. Um, also, I should have the right chirality there. I just didn't write that for space reasons. Uh, that should be 0. The magic is that because I'm assuming that I have eight linearly independent c of x's, um, excuse me, eight linearly independent epsilons, the only way this equation can be solved at a generic point in space-time is for that equation to hold. So because I've got eight of these guys, I have to be able to strip them off because of linear independence. Now all of a sudden, you can do a lot because if that equation holds, that equation holds. If that equation holds, all of a sudden you get integrability conditions because you know what these are? These are this this anti-commutator involves a lot of curvatures just get curvatures acting on various things must vanish. So you get a number of algebraic equations. In fact, you also get a differential equation. If I choose two d's of the opposite chirality, you get a vector derivative of something vanishing. 
And so the integrability conditions actually tell you that the curvatures are actually covariantly constant. But for this argument, you must have maximum number of suits. Yes. So this is special. This is special for 4 for n equal 1 and 8 for n equal 2. The minute I start doing anything else, this does not work. Even a single subsymmetry wouldn't work. Yeah, wouldn't work. Yeah. So this is why this works. This is this is why you get a drastic simplification. Why well, can't you restrict the harmonic axes and then get, get some, something that sort of partially works? I mean, it seems like you would be you'd get happy if you're doing something that's sort of like uh, DPS like. You get half of the Ds are integrable on this on this condition. Possibly. It's just the, it's not that it's not obvious how. Like, so in general, it's not even obvious how the Xs decompose, like how the pieces have to have to mix. Um, I can ask the question differently. Why is it obvious that if you drop the condition of n equal 8 Cz and drop down n equal 1, why is it clear that it doesn't work? Um, basically because, I mean, so the idea is that this is, this is some x-dependent matrix. I mean, so if I write it, let me write it another way. So what this equation really is, this is, let me write it schematically like this. C, let me write this C transpose. C is some dressing factor times epsilon. And so really what this equation is, is epsilon transpose some dressing factor. And the idea is, this is eight of them, but I assume I've got all eight of them. And so I can do that. And then I can do that. And then I'm done. That's the idea. And I should mention this, um, I think this was first noticed in superspace by Sergei Kuzhenko a few years ago. And I then, they then, he then exploited it with um, just Novak and Gabriel Tetlina Masichelli in five dimensions last year. Okay. So um, what can you do with this? Well, um, you have, the, you have the, this, this algebra that I gave you at the spinner-spinner the, the level. You can actually just crank through and work out the entire Riemann tensor by, by solving the superspace Bianchi at that piece. And here it is. Uh, it's, it's bilinear in all of these objects. Um, that's, I mean, again, I don't need to remember the details of this, except to remember it's bilinear in all the objects. So in principle, you have the curvature tensor. Um, you have a bunch of conditions, which I haven't yet told you, algebraic conditions telling you certain of these objects can be turned on when certain other objects are turned off. I'll get, I'll get to that in more detail later. But we're not, we're not quite done yet. I mean, because, I mean, you know what the Riemann tensor looks like, but you still want to figure out what, what is the space that gives me a Riemann tensor that looks like this? What, what spaces am I talking about? So I, I want to still know question, I want to know the answer to questions like, what, what's the global structure of these spaces? And how do we actually know that the full set of killing spinners exists? All, all I've imposed so far is an integrability condition. And this is, this is actually, this is what happens. This is, this is why we can actually get a lot of mileage very, very quickly. And the idea, the basic idea is that because we have constant curvature tensors, we're dealing with coset space. In fact, we're dealing with a super coset space. Well, more accurately, what I should say is, for any superspace algebra that has constant curvatures, I can construct, or one can construct, a global super coset space with those same curvatures. And so this is the, uh, the fine print that I talked about on the first slide. Um, I, can, I can exhibit a global super coset space with the same algebra. It's possible that there are spaces that I can construct with discrete quotients uh, that I won't be talking about. I'm just going to be dealing with the global spaces. Right. So super coset spaces. Well, perhaps I should actually um, just remind you what a coset space actually is. A super coset space is really no different. You just pepper the word super in front of everything and not the same. So just a quick review. Suppose I have a Lie group G and some subgroup H. Uh, the coset G mod H is a space of equivalences. G is identified with G times H if H is an element of big H. I'm going to assume the Lie algebras G and H decompose in a very specific way um, as a sum of K and H. H is a subgroup because Big H is a subgroup. Um, I'm assuming that the Ks here, the things that aren't in H, are in a representation of H. So H acting on K gives me that K. And the algebra of whatever's left over that isn't in H, the algebra of K with K is just whatever it is. Uh, I make no restrictions on that. 
Schematically, the coset is generated by the keys. So uh, more constructively, a sort of more, more um, you know, you know physics -y. Uh, I think of the Ks as morally momentum generators, Ps. And I think of the Hs as morally rotation generators, Ms. And an element of G mod H, I can, I can think of as generating by exponentiating the Ps with coordinates. And these coordinates would be the local coordinates describing that space. And the action of G, the original group, on the coset space, you can always write it in the following way. G acting on the coset representative, L of X, gives you a new coset representative at a new point, L of X prime. It gives you the same coset representative at a new point, L of X prime, times uh, some element of H. And by this identification, that's just L of X prime. So all G does, acting on the coset, is to move you to a different point on the coset. The reason this is useful is that the, the local geometry is entirely encoded in the choice of coset representative and the algebra of G and H. So if I have some coset representative, L of X, that I get by exponentiating these Ps, I can construct something called the cartan mauer form, L inverse DL. That has to live, because it's a differential element, has to live in, in the Lie algebra, so I can expand it on the basis of Ps and Ms, because they span the Lie algebra. I can choose to call the coefficients, the one-form coefficients of those generators, E and omega, and I want to think about them as I want to think of them as a field line and a spin connection. The covariant derivatives that I can construct um, in this way, in the standard way, out of the field line and spin connection, automatically inherit the algebra that the p's and the m's obey to begin with. So p with p gives a structure constant times p and a structure constant times m. You can show that the output of the covariant derivatives has a torsion tensor and a Riemann tensor, which are precisely those structure constants. And finally, uh, things that are maybe quite difficult to calculate, given a generic kill, uh, uh, kill line and spin connection. For example, finding killing vectors that obey that condition turn out to be encoded algebraically in the structure. So if I take a generic element of the Lie algebra um, with constant epsilon and constant lambda and conjugate it by L, I can read off uh, something also valued in the Lie algebra, where the object in front of the P is precisely the killing factor. And this is just an algebraic problem. You find that C of x is given by some dressing factor times that epsilon, and some dressing factor times that. Now, everything I've just said, absolutely nothing changes if I just put the word super in front of everything. So let me just show you how this works you know, schematically for a super coset. For example, if I'm talking about EDS4, uh, that super coset is OSP2 slash 4. Um, I'll come back to what that means in another slide or two. Actually, I'll say it just a moment. Um, what this algebra looks like is, well, let me start with the P's. P with P gives an M with the modulus of SIJ squared in front of it, and the sign tells you that's ADS4. If I do the algebra of Q with Q, I get a Lorentz generator and an R symmetry generator. Uh, the I here is an SU2R generator. Q left and Q right gives a P, and Q with P gives back a P. For the super coset space, all you do differently is instead of just X's and P's, you have X's and P's and P's and Q's. Uh, the killing spinners now, you calculate them for a super coset just like you calculate killing vectors for a regular coset. You sandwich um, some constant element in the odd part of the super Lie algebra between two L's. And you do some, do some you know, matrix manipulations, some algebra, and you read off x c of x. And that's precisely some dressing factor times these constant epsilons. And that's exactly the killing spinners. And you're done. So we've turned a problem in, uh, in differential geometry, solving the killing spinner equation, to if you wish, a problem of algebra, or more honestly, a problem for Mathematica. So what are the allowed spaces? Well, let me just remind you, these are the constant background fields that we had. Sij, uh, which was complex, Z, which was complex, and two real guys, G and Gij. A couple comments about these. Z uh, is a complex field strength once you analyze the integrability conditions, which means it's closed. 
I mentioned this earlier, if we called it Z in part because if you had a complex central charge, Z would be the field strength associated with that central charge. And just an interesting comment, this G turns out to have a nice interpretation as the dual of some three-form field strength, H, which makes a lot of sense because uh, in, one of, in one of the simpler versions of Poincaré supergravity, you could have had a tensor multiple. So you mean for the remote tensor? No, no, the algebraic parameters you talked about, the question is take bilinears and those and decompose to get this uh, tensor. Yes, yeah, 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 for the killing spinner equation. Yeah, yeah basically, these, this, is, this is what you need, this is the set that you need to sort of exhaustive, exhaustively span all the possibilities of the killing spinner equation. What happened to the other equations for other fermions? Uh, right. I heard the integrability argument, but right. it didn't clearly tell me do so, I have to consider only the gravitational transformation right. and no other fermion or some fermion? So the answer is, mm. if you notice, I didn't even say anything about the gravitino transformation. So the reason the gravitino holds is because it's super, super coset space, you can go through and you can show that um, that equation for the gravitino to vanish is precisely the, the equation that the killing spinner obeys when you construct it from the super coset. Similarly, your other fermions, other fermions might be constructed by, um, your other fermions are all gonna be covariant fermions. So they're gonna be things constructed by taking spinner derivatives of things like this. So the lowest component of this is gonna be some fermion rho alpha kij. But the condition for this to be super symmetric is basically the condition that if I hit it with another spinner derivative and take the lowest component, I get zero. But that's an equation in a sense that uh, whose integrability condition I've already solved. And then when you go through the super coset construction, it turns out to be solved automatically. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we didn't check this explicitly. To check this explicitly, you need to construct the whole coset representative in terms of x and theta. But it's guaranteed that it has to happen. So we just basically truncated the theta equals zero because we just cared about the killing spinners on space time. But in principle, you could actually see this explicitly by constructing this guy as a function of x and theta. That's okay. Actually here, it, uh, what I said is slightly wrong. This guy is actually a constant. This guy isn't a constant because of all the connections in him. So you, you would find this guy both out of the x and theta dependent connections, hit it with another derivative, you would find it with, it with zero, guaranteed by the cosine structure. So we end up with three sets of integrability conditions, or three sets of solutions to our integrability conditions. They basically break down into three options. Pretty simple options, actually. The first one is you just had SIJ turned on. That's actually there to give you, in Lorentzian signature, that gives you EDS4, which I'll get to in just a moment. I'll say that in a little bit more detail. Um, another option is the other isotriplet is turned on. Gij alone is non zero. And he has to decompose as a product of a vector and an isovector. And the third option, which is the most interesting option, is the one where you can have these guys turned on. You can have one of them turned on, the other one turned on, or both turned on. If they're and both turned or, are turned on, you have a certain transversality condition which has to be. I should also mention that, um, just in passing, that these background fields determine the R symmetry in, this, uh, in, a, in actually two different ways. One of them is very obvious. Their VEV breaks the R symmetry. Uh, so for example, the isotriplets, GIJ and SIJ, they clearly break SU2 when they take a VEV. In fact, they're gonna, because you can think about them as a vector in SO3, what they're doing is breaking SU2 to SO2. Uh, also, Z and S are complex. They rotate under the U1 R symmetry. So if they're turned on, they break the U1 R symmetry. So that's the one obvious way that these things affect R symmetry. The less obvious way is that they appear, um, they appear multiplying internal R symmetry automorphisms of the SUSY algebra. So not only do we, uh, when these things are, not only do these things break your external group of automorphisms that you could imagine having, but they also uh, if some of these things are turned on, they actually generate 
our symmetry in the SUSY algebra itself. So if S is turned on, it generates uh, an, S, an SO2 subgroup of SU2 in, in the SUSY algebra. You generate that as part of the SUSY algebra. If Z is turned on, all of the SU2 is generated in the SUSY algebra. If G is turned on, all of the SU2 appears in the SUSY algebra. If GIJ is turned on, you, this blackboard A is the U1R sub, or this is the U1R. Um, the U1R is generated as well. So two different ways. This is the somewhat non trivial one. So let me just describe what you actually end up with. So let me first just describe the geometries. Uh, so these are going to be the simplest cases. This is the case where I only have one of these fields turned on. I'm going to deal with the mixed case on the, uh, in a slide or two. So the case where I just have one of these fields turned on, you get relatively simple things. ADS4, okay. Oh, I should mention this is Lorentzian. Uh, ADS4, you know, obviously you had to have that. Uh, you get R cross S3, where R is in the time direction. You get ADS3 cross R, where R is in the spatial direction. They could also be, those R's could be compact S1s if you wanted. You also get a plane wave object, which is related to those. You get two copies of those, for reasons I'll get to shortly. And then another option that you have is ABS2 cross S2, where these two have different radii. And then versions where you take the radius to infinity, flattening either the ABS2 or the S2. And then a plane wave version. And I didn't write them in costume for because of course that's obvious. So let's, how, how do we get ABS4? Well, ABS4 comes from when SIJ is turned on. That involves a supergroup OSP2 slash 4. I should mention, if you've never seen this notation before, that um, what OSP2 slash 4 is, if I just look at the bosonic part of this group, uh, it is um, SP4, roughly speaking, times SO2. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is for ADS4. This is the R symmetry in this case. SP4 is the same thing as uh, SO5, which is the same thing as, um, uh, well, to a physicist, it's approximately the same thing as SO3 comma 2. So, I mean, there probably should be a star there. Um, but this is the space time group, and this is the R symmetry group. That's the bosonic part of the OSP2 slash 4. Daniel? Yes. Um, so, you don't get. Um, you do. Um, I'm sticking with Lorentzian for this slide. I'll get to the Euclidean version in a couple slides. What about like uh, R times H3, where R is time? Right. Um, that's interesting. That's actually forbidden to you by Susan. Uh, so you can't do that. Yeah. And you said the ADS goal is obvious. It's just because the compensator has a scalar. Right. Well, just, I mean, you know, of course you have to get ADS4. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a vacuum of. Yeah, once you do that. Right. Well, I'm just saying, like, it's actually a vacuum of supergravity theory. But in 60, that would be true. There's no idea of 60. Just did 61, right. 0, that would not be obvious. I don't think so. I think, I think that's correct. Yeah, that would be obvious. So, um, why do I get these two different options? Well, um, you probably anticipated this. I had two different vectors in the theory. So. Uh, one option corresponds to having one of the vectors turned on. The other option corresponds to having the other vector turned on. And whether the R direction is in a time direction, space direction, or null direction depends on if the vector is time like, space like, or null. Um, the interesting thing about these two cases is that they have different supergroups. They have different supersymmetry realizations that, may, that, that, that have different amounts of R symmetry. So let me just talk about the R cross S3s now. If I have GIJ turned on, uh, the supergroup turns out to be SU21 cross SU21. Um, just to tell you what this is, because I didn't put it on the transparency. SU21, its bosonic part, is SU2 cross U1. If I say SU22, its bosonic part is SU2 cross SU2. So I have different uh, representations of supersymmetry. 
Here, the supercharges are split. Half of them live in this supergroup, half of them live in this supergroup. In this case, all of the supercharges live here, and none of them live here. And that will have ramifications uh, in just a moment. So, oh, sorry. Uh, so this is a supergroup, and this is a supergroup. This is a supergroup, but this is not a supergroup. This is a regular group. So in this case, all of the supercharges live here. In this case, all of this, the supercharges are split between them. And this is, this is for, for group theoretic reasons, which I'll get to in a few slides, that's actually why you can actually deform this case. Because it turns out you can deform this case, but preserving the, su the, the supercharges because you can, you can kill that guy. Whereas here, because the supercharges live in both places, you can't quite do that. But I'll, and the fact that G is a uh, non-trivial Lorentz structure is saying you should take the parts that the isometry group is this diagonal of the boson. Yes. So of the simplest cases, the other option that we have is ABS2 cross S2. That corresponds to having this complex two form turned on. Uh, basically, the options are in this, these sort of degenerate cases. It basically has one piece, which is purely spatial. We call that elliptic. It's mod squared, it's positive. In this case, um, it has a leg in a, in a time direction. We call that hyper, hyperbolic. It's mod squared, it's negative. There's a plane wave case. Um, but the most general case, it actually has two pieces, which are sort of the pieces that give you support for the ABS2 and support for the S2. The supergroups in those cases, uh, this one turns out to be a very nice supergroup called D21 alpha, uh, which has some you know, fun properties. Uh, these are degenerate cases of that. So let me just very quickly give you, run through D21 alpha because I actually think it's a very neat little supergroup. Um, just some historical observations. Uh, there is a non-trivial spherically symmetric solution of n equal to gauge supergravity, which is ABS2 cross S2 of equal radii. So it's a solution of an actual supergravity theory. Uh, that's a special case of D21 alpha. Um, the eight supercharges there give this supergroup SU11 slash 2. This actually describes the near horizon geometry of an extremal APS horizon or a black hole. I mean, there's a whole story related to the attractor mechanism, which I'm not going to get into. This can be generalized. You can think of D21 alpha as generalizing this to different radii. The alpha in D21 alpha is the ratio of the radii. So it's a one parameter supergroup. The interesting thing is these are not supergravity solutions. So these rigid backgrounds, this one in particular, this cannot be found as a vacuum solution of any four-dimensional theory. And you can actually, you can actually uh, argue this with, 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 um, with very weak assumptions. Where even if you couple it to matter? Even if you couple it to matter. So the, the, the precise statement is the following. Take conform, any 40 n equal to conformal supergravity, couple, couple it to arbitrary two derivative actions of vectors and hypermultiplets. Uh, um, when you look at the allowed fully supersymmetric solutions, you have Minkowski, ABS4, ADS2 cross S2 of equal radii, and I think the plane wave version of ADS2 cross S2. That's all you have. Now that's not necessarily a problem because we're just looking at rigid geometries here. Um, I'll get, get to maybe some physical origin of this thing at the end. Let me just mention because this is interesting to me, I found this kind of cool. The D21 alpha has a very interesting bosonic subgroup, which is SU1, comma 1, the non-compact SU2, cross SU2, cross SU2. And the Qs live in a doublet, doublet, doublet representation of this group for a certain representation of the gamma matrices. The way you can think about this is this SU1, comma 1 is a space-time symmetric group of the ADS2. The SU2 is a space-time symmetric group of the S2. And the SU2R is the R symmetry group. And the algebra of the Qs with the Qs in a certain basis is really quite simple. I mention this because this has actually been studied recently with various applications. This paper in particular found links between this and, or uh, between theories on ADS2 cross S2 with Louisville theory. So why do we, what's so important about having these uh, multiple versions of some of these cases? In particular, what about the R cross S3? Um, I mentioned this already, but here I'll let me say this in a little bit more detail. 
the arc accessory is interesting because we had these two different realizations of it. But this guy turned on, this was a supergroup. But this guy turned on, this was a supergroup. Suppose you want to squash this thing in some way. Suppose you want to squash the S3. Um, the reason I have an SU2 and an SU2 and an SU2 and an SU2, the reason there are all these SU2s floating around is that the space-time group of the space-time symmetry group of an S3 is SO4. And SO4 is SU2 cross SU2. If I squash the S3, I have to break the space-time symmetry groups. And so schematically, what I would want to do is if I squash it, I want to break some amount of these groups somehow. But it's it's sort of I mean, after the fact, we've noticed this. It's, it's sort of easy to see here that this is a really small supergroup. There's no way to squash part either that SU2 or that SU2 without breaking the supergroup because there, there are super there, there are fermionic charges in that group. So there's just no way to squash this. There's no way to deform this and preserve the SUSE. Whereas for this case, schematically, it's quite easy to see that squashing this just kills the other SU2. And you can preserve that supergroup. It's something more complicated than that, but that, that's morally what's, what's happening. I can take the background with this guy, where, where the G is sourcing um, the R press S3. I can turn on the Z and, and squash the S3, preserving all eight supercharges. Geometrically, what's happening is you're turning the Z A B um, on along the S3. And if you think of the S3 as an S1 fibered over an S2, what you're doing is you're squashing the S1 fiber. So this, this breaks SU2 cross SU2, the, the, um, the space-time group, to SU2 cross U1. And for whatever reason, Susie dictates that you're only allowed to do a squashing. This parameter here, so this is the, um, this is the metric on the S2. This is the, um, the fibering of S1 on the S, uh, over the S2. This parameter here, in front of the fiber, has to be between 0 and 1. Turns out to be built out of the BABs of Sentinel G. Did you say you can keep you one? Say again. Did you say you can keep you one? Right, so what happens is, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm being very, very schematic here. Uh, there actually, there's a, there's a, what happened? So in principle, there is also a U1 here that gets kept, but then you end up dividing out by different H's, in this case, in this case. So probably I shouldn't say there's a cross U1 there. Um, it's just, it's, it's the, the identification is a little bit tricky because the H groups are different in both cases. Excuse me. Yeah. Why was, why is the squash were not listed in your, in your table? Could you repeat? Why is the squash the were not listed in your previous table? You have a table of all n code 2. Oh, sorry, that, that was, sorry, that was, those were the simplest cases. Uh -huh. So I'm about to show you the complete, the rest of the set. So this is the, this is the interesting stuff. Oh, let me skip that. Um, get to the fun stuff. This is this is actually what for us was the interesting stuff. So I turn on both of these things. I've already mentioned that if G was timelike, and I turn on Z, uh, I can get a squash S3. Of course, for the for when G is space-like and you have an ADS3 cross R, you can also repeat the story. It's actually a good deal more complicated here. In this case, it turns out the only option because of the transversality condition between G and Z, Z had to be purely spatial. So there's only one option. Because G is space-like here, Z can be spatial, or it could have a leg in a time direction, or it could have a leg in a null direction. And when it has a leg in, when, when it's purely spatial, it actually can be, uh, can be a little bit turned on, or it could be a lot turned on, or it could be at some critical value. And these give you a lot, of, these give you several different options. These three cases are basically morally, if you want, wick rotations, double wick rotations in this case. Uh, one case is you can do what's called a time-like stretching of ADS3. So if you think it, um, of ADS3 as, if you wish, a time-like circle fibered over uh, an H2, you can stretch the time fiber. Uh, you can do something called a space-like squashing of ADS3. If you think about it as, um, I guess an H1 fibered over an EDS2, you can squash the H1 fiber. Um, there's another version that you can call, that's called null warp or light like warp EDS3 that you can produce. This option is interesting. It's, uh, 
It's a Lorentzian S3 times R. So what a, what a Lorentzian S3 is, is you start with something which topologically looks like an S3. You write it as an S1 fibered over an S2, and then you flip the sign in front of the S1 fiber. And this gives you a Lorentzian metric. I don't know if this is important, but we, we discovered this actually, if you take the tau nut, uh, if you take tau nut in um, Lorentzian signature, and you look at it at a constant radial slicing, it's precisely a Lorentzian S3. It's actually what we learned about that from a very beautiful pa paper from Meisner in 1963. And there's some other interesting cases. This, this critical case gives you a Heisenberg group. Um, this case here, which is null, gives you something that we call a light-like S3. And then we also have some plane wave geometries, which we didn't analyze in much detail. We mentioned Euclidean backgrounds. So um, I was, that was all Lorentzian signature. And you can imagine Lorentzian signature is, quite, is a bit more complicated because you have different directions that can point in. Um, Euclidean signature, in comparison, is much easier, uh, except there's some fine print about what you actually mean by Euclidean. So one thing you could mean by Euclidean is something that could arise by wick rotating a uh, Lorentzian case, or to put it uh, sort, of, uh, sort of in, in uh, sort of more correct terminology, uh, something which uh, obeys reflection positivity, which is basically the same thing. So we didn't worry, to, we didn't actually look at the ones that arise but that are reflection positive. Because morally, those should just all be wick rotations, everything I just told you. Instead, what we did is um, we assumed that we were dealing with a real Euclidean theory, meaning we had supercharges that had to go into other supercharges under complex conjugation. Usually, uh, an honest Euclidean theory that you get by wick rotating doesn't have to obey, uh, doesn't have to be real under complex conjugation. So we said, okay, let's assume reality under complex, case, complex conjugation. And tell us uh, what that gives. Which time do we have? <laughs> like four minutes. Or no, we started late. Yeah, we started a little late. Well, let me, let me wrap up this slide and then go to my conclusion. Awesome. I'll, I'll skip over the actions bit. Um, so, um, what the important story about any about Euclidean signature is that your your spinners, um, if you choose them to be real. The most you can do is impose sim symplectic Majorana vial reality conditions on them, meaning your left-handed spinners have to conjugate into themselves, and the right-handed spinners have to conjugate into themselves. And so in particular, that means your left-handed and right-handed supercharges are independent of each other. So these complex fields, S and S bar, now I'm calling them S and S tilde, they're independent because one of them has to do with the left-handed supercharges, the other one has to do with the right-handed supercharges. And similarly for Z and Z tilde. So um, that comment really has to do with this last case. If I go through all these cases, you see nothing that should surprise you based on what I said in Lorentzian. Instead of ADS4, um, you find that I can have both S4 and H4. Let me emphasize the reason there's an S4 here. Wig rotation should have only given me the H4. The reason the S4 is there is because I'm not assuming that this theory came from wick rotation. I just imposed reality on the superchargers. That allows both an S4 and an H4. For G and GA, one of them can give me an H3. The other one can give me an S3. And that's it. You can't have the converse. The G case can be squashed in various ways or deformed in various ways. And the case where the Z's turned on can be just H2 cross S2. We do not see S2 cross S2 or H2 cross H2. And that's, again, just imposed by the structure of the algebra and the way you impose the reality conditions. Where this comment is relevant, is that you can also do something funny where you have S tilde turned off and Z tilde turned off, and you just have Z and S turned off. Remember the Riemann tensor that I showed you way, way back ago, it was bilinear in these objects. In this case, the Riemann tensor vanishes. So this is flat space. But the SUSY algebra isn't the SUSY algebra of flat space. In this case, the left-handed SUSY algebra is deformed in some way. This has actually been noticed before. One, one of the cases in here is precisely the full C limit of the omega background. The omega background in two parameters. If you choose them to be equal to each other, or opposite each other, I forget the conventions. Um, you just all you do is you get flat space back, but with a with a deformed left-handed Susy algebra. But uh, there are other possibilities here. Side modifications. 
Okay, so I'm skipping over matter actions. Uh, we jump right to the end. So conclusions, open questions. So we have found all, again, global rigid n equal two spaces, and we've constructed general rigid actions for vectors and hypers, which I skipped over. So there are some gaps and some unanswered questions. The first, which I mentioned, was that we assume global manifolds. I assume these were global super set spaces. But there are a lot, there, it's clear that you can make discrete quotients. Really obvious one um, that was pointed out by my, uh, by, by Gianluca's name, was that if you have this R cross S3, um, you can actually check that the Kelly standards are independent of the R direction. So you can quotient, you can assume the R is an S1 and then quotient along it. And that's just, just going to, um, oh no, 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 sorry, I said that backwards. You write the S3 as an S1, sorry, you write the S3 as an S1 fiber over an S2. You find out that the killing spinners are independent of the S1 fiber, so you can quotient along the S1, and that just gives you a lens space. But there are other cases, you could imagine. Um, and we're, we're looking at that now, trying to see if we can exhaustively explain them all. Um, another, case, another point, which we talked about a little bit, is that um, not all of these arise from 4D supergravity plus normal matter. I think um, this is probably the most complete reference that, that, that deals with this. If you take the most general 4D supergravity plus matter that you can think of that's allowed in four dimensions, you don't get all of these backgrounds. So that doesn't mean these are unphysical. Um, it was pointed out to us by uh, Dima Sorokin that this D21 alpha case of ADS2 cross S2 with different radii, you could imagine getting it from some 6D theory on ADS2 cross S2 cross S2, and maybe compactifying along one of the S2s. You could imagine generating this geometry that way. So from a four-dimensional perspective, this would have exotic matter. It would have matter that transforms under the central charge associated with the hidden directions that you're not seeing. So that's why it's not contained within that classification. Um, many of these spaces that we talked about had trivial R factors, and so it's completely obvious you can just reduce to four dimensions or reduced to three dimensions. Three-dimensional Euclidean, a three-dimensional Lorentzian. And in so doing, you would get a 3D n equal four set of spaces. Uh, there are almost certainly other 3D n equal four spaces than just those. It'd be really interesting to look at. Um, finally, uh, though I didn't uh, mention, I didn't talk about this, I should just mention that if you look at the configurations, if you look at the actions for vector multiplets and hypermultiplets in these backgrounds, and you look at the conditions for full SUSY, so if you look for the fully supersymmetric vacua, the presence of these background fields in the theory deforms those conditions. So uh, sort of the vacua configurations of 4D n equal 2 theories on these rigid spaces are different from what they are in the cost, at least a little bit. And so it'd be interesting to think about how that modifies, you know, sort of simple questions about quantum field theory. If you try to do, uh, for example, like a separate weight analysis, perhaps on some of these spaces, how would that look different? Well, so I guess Preston gives the answer for S1, right? Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, so like, yeah, thinking about that, I mean, like, is it, is it just trivial or, yeah, I, it would be really interesting to sort of know that for sure for the other cases. Consider uh, any one of the existing matter coupled n equals two supergravities mm -hmm. and do what Seibeck uh, et al. did. Mm -hmm. Would you get only a subset of the results you have? Uh, of, of these backgrounds? Of the app? So, I mean, when you, when you, when you mean like what he did with Gia and that original paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this, so this, yeah, you should, I think you should get all of these cases. I didn't check that specifically, but you're, in that analysis, you're just, you're decoupling and then you're taking, sending the Planck mass to infinity. You're not setting the gravity on shell, so you're free to just, you know, fix it however you want. I think you should be able to generate all of these. Um, I didn't check that, but. But your strategy at the beginning, what you told us, was to take the most general, the biggest, longest right. compensator is that. Right. That had the kind of uh, hint that by doing that, you're yes. going to get yeah. more general backgrounds than you would get if you started simply from existing right. 
theory, right? Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, yeah. Uh, so this is the answer, this is, I can tell you the answer for four and eight for n equal one and n equal two. It's an excellent question. For n equal two, it seems like the zoo of backgrounds, if you just took the, the n equal two minimal multiplet, so vector plus conformal supergravity, you get almost all of these. You get every case except gij. Gij you get if you couple it, if you use instead of the minimal. Gij, 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 sorry. If you, if you choose instead of the minimal multiplet, you take the formal supergravity coupled to a tensor multiplet, yeah. you do the same thing, yeah. you'll get the other case. Yeah. So, so all cases are covered by the minimals. Right. And that's true also for n equal one. All cases are covered by the minimals. Okay. So the, the interesting question is, well, is everything co covered by the minimals? What about like four supercharges for n equal two? What about uh, two supercharges or one supercharge for n equal one? As far as I know, uh, I mean, I don't know the answer to this question. As far as I know, nobody's looked at a more general n equal one formulation um, and looked at you know the one supercharge or two supercharge case. That would be that would be really interesting to know that. Um, my assumption is my, my my feeling is that for the lesser supercharges, you're not you're not restricted so much, so there should be some some extra freedom in there, some extra options. Um, but I don't know for sure. Plus, didn't you write something that did exactly the opposite? Oh, we say, well, there are more, that seems that's what you the naive thing, but then there right. are more auxiliary structures that you right. can use to. Well, in principle, there are more auxiliaries, but it, I know in the maximal case, when you keep all supercharges, you end up just reproducing back the minimal ones. So in principle, there are more options. Um, I don't know for sure if, for all configurations, the minimal options cover everything. They cover everything for the maximal configurations for a but the maximal case is very simple because everything just reduces to a coset space and everything is super tractable. Right. Now, why don't we thank those people? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, right, right. so the squash cases you get, they're not on shell solutions. Um, so morally, so if you take the minimal split, what G is, is the Higgs P1 field. Mm -hmm. So you know, take, take the one eats the phase of X. And the Z is, is, the, is, the, is uh, the, the field strength of the vector multiplet. So it will still get it. You can still get it. Yes, you can. Now, if you put that in any way on shell, if you couple it to a hyper, mm -hmm. you find that G always happens. Because when you turn couple to a hyper, G turns, all, turns out to always be a fermion bilinear. Okay, very good. Thanks for the work. How long will you be here? I, I'm here. Um, I'm here till Monday morning. Wednesday. 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 Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Wednesday morning. Sorry. Wednesday. That's a big difference. No, that's yeah. a huge difference. Sorry. Uh, Wednesday morning. You, you leave on Wednesday morning. So if you're gonna interact, there's only tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Tomorrow. Okay. Interact. Today's gonna be a bit hard. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. Thanks. See you. And now I do a very naive question. And bigger than two, right. you can work because you don't have one more question. Yeah. Right. And and the, can I say that all the ten bigger than two languages should be falling into this this, this cell? Um. Actually, actually, let me back up a second. Let me back up a second. Um. I don't. I don't actually think that. Um, yeah. Actually. You have um, at least the two, right? What I said. Yeah. You do for n equal two. What I said was wrong, though. For n equal four, you can do this. Um, the different what you would you would literally do exactly what I did. You would choose, but um, you would choose an unconstrained superfield, an unconstrained n equal four superfield, which is off shell. Uh, it is horribly unphysical. Corresponds to no multiple anyone to my mind has ever studied. Yeah, but you, one hundred twenty-eight Yeah, square one hundred. It's one hundred twenty-eight squared times one hundred twenty-eight squared, okay. or it might be two hundred fifty-six squared divided by two. It's one or the other. I think well, it's huge. Saying, like, it's huge. It, well, it's, it's huge as well. You already included a bunch of unphysical pieces in this one. So. Right. But for the maximal, like, so um, one thing we're looking at, we're actually looking at um, n equal 4 keeping 16 supercharges. Because the analysis is very similar to this. What um, is the so take an unconstrained scalar superfield. Right. Yeah, no, actually, that's what I was going to ask. So this is the answer to a question I was trying to formulate. Basically, like, why don't you just put whatever the hell you want through the auxiliary field structure as long as it's somehow a representation?
expectation. I think, yeah, system. I mean, I think the answer is. Now you're telling me that is exactly what you do. Yeah, actually, I think you can do that because morally, what you do is um, you can you can so for an equal fourth is certainly true. You can start with conformal supergravity, and you can couple it to an unconstrained um, scalar. And the unconstrained scalar, what it gives you at the theta squared level, is quite ob quite obviously all possible Lorentz times SU2 decompositions, because it's the whole set of theta squareds, right? So all of those possibilities are encoded at the theta squared level of a scalar superfield. So if you repeat this for any n, in principle, you could do it. So, so